we're talking about marriage. Last one, and I hope you've been enjoying receiving a lot this month from what we've been teaching you. It's been blessing, I believe it has. Uh, it's been blessing me. It's been, it's been really, you know, challenging, changing, even, even my own marriage in some areas where I needed to kind of change and make a new hotel, even after 30 years, okay? And it, the, the good news is it's never too late. Amen? Amen? Never too late to help your marriage. Yes. Let's open our Bibles to the book of Matthew, chapter 19, verse 28. Yes. We're going to begin there. And there it says, Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on the glorious, on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Now let's jump over to chapter 20, verse 20. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons, who is John and James, by the way, came to Jesus with her sons and, kneeling down, asked a favor of him. What is it you want? He asked. She said, Grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right hand and the other at your left in the kingdom. Now, don't, you don't know what you are asking, she said to them. Can you drink the cup I am going to drink? We can, they asked. They answered. Jesus said to them, You will indeed drink from my cup, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my Father. When the ten heard about this, they were indignant with the two brothers. Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and their wild officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for men. <coughs> Today we're going to be talking about one of the most important attitudes um, that we must have in our marriage. Okay? And before we get into the point, I'm going to kindly ask everybody to turn off your cell phones for this or mute it in Jesus' name. It's distracting you, okay? And I can't even imagine how it's distracting everybody else around you. So turn it off, mute it, throw it in the garbage. No, man, you don't want to get into that. The most important attitude that we must have in a marriage, okay, is the attitude of a servant. Yes. Come on, the attitude of a servant. If you don't have the attitude of a servant, then you're always going to be demanding of your spouse. You're always going to be critical of your spouse. You're always going to be always asking and never contributing to your marriage. And the Bible clearly says that we are called to be servants. As a matter of fact, we have the greatest example in the Bible, who is Jesus, the servant of servants. He is a king. The Bible calls him a king, but the Bible also says that he is a humble king. A king who serves. Who ever heard of such a thing? A king who serves, who bends low to wash somebody's feet. You know, here we, we, we read in verse 28 of chapter 19 how Jesus begins to announce to his disciples that in the future reign of Jesus on earth, he's going to set aside thrones. He's going to set aside positions of power and authority. And these positions of power and authority will be for his disciples and everybody who follows them. So he was talking to disciples, to the people he called to serve people. And here he announces that as you serve, there's going to be promotion coming to you. Promotion is just down the corner. But unfortunately, his mother misunderstood the whole thing. She wanted him to guarantee them a spot next to him. In other words, she wanted Jesus to say, please, guarantee for me now that John, me, and Jane Z is going to have a special place next to you at your throne. That's when he begins to say, yeah, there's, there's definitely going to be places reserved by my father for everyone. But don't be able to understand the principle behind what I'm saying. Before power and prestige, there must be service. 
Before you experience power and prestige, you must have humility of heart, and you must be the first one to serve. Yes. Yeah. As Jesus said, I have not come to be served, but I have come to serve. Amen. And even goes further, I have come also to give my life as a ransom for many. Mm -hmm. That word ransom has to do with the ransom that we pay if we get kidnapped. In this case here, he's talking about the ransom that he has to pay to free us from the power of sin and darkness and Satan over our lives. Because we were slaves to sin. So Jesus not only came to serve, but he came to also liberate us from slavery to sin and lead us into his grace, into his kingdom. So this is the ultimate service here. This is somebody who served to the utmost and led us through and gave us an example for us to follow, okay? Now, what is the meaning of a servant? What is the meaning of a servant? A servant is this. It is to humble yourself and to put the good of others before yourself. Do I need to say that again? Yes. It is to humble yourself and put the good of others before yourself. In other words, you're going to look at the other's interests before you look at your own interests. That's what it is to be a servant. Also, it is to lose your life in service for God and for others. Amen. And when you get married, that is what God expects of you. That's what God teaches for us. Not only for us who are married, but for everybody else. Now maybe you're here and you're not married. You don't want to get married. That's fine. Some people say that marriage is like flies. Ever open up your screen door? You will notice that there's flies that are trying to get in and flies that are trying to get out. <laughs> some marriage is just like deliverance. <laughs> I understand. Maybe you went through some rough times. Uh, but there are others who want to get married. And there are those who aren't married. There are those who are beyond the age of getting married. You think so? Either way, we're all called to be serious. Amen, church. So it is to humble yourself and to put others before yourself and to lose your life in service of God and others. Now today I was over at my in-law's house and we were celebrating Amanda's birthday today. I'm not going to say how old she is because she'll never forgive me for that. We're going to have a tendency of doing that. But it was her birthday today and Pastor Alex and I together with Brian we were having a little dispute. We were trying to see which wife would actually bring to us the birthday cake. <laughs> and the whole idea behind it is we wanted to see which wife was the most submissive, the most active. <laughs> So we have this little challenge going on between us. Brian was like, my wife is completely submissive. <laughs> I know she would bring a piece of cake to me first before you guys. Alex said, no way, I've been married longer. I taught my wife well. <laughs> she is completely submitted to my authority. You are going to see it. And I said, well, I'm the pastor. And she's the pastor. She has to be the primary example. <laughs> how it actually happened. Brian turns to Lorraine and says, Lorraine, could you please bring me a piece of cake? Lorraine turns to him and says, well, I have this terrible pain in my ankle. I can't come to you. Then Pastor Alec turns to Pastor Carla. Oh, but by the way, Brian did say that she had it in her heart to bring it to him. She did. And she actually did later, much later, much later. <laughs> So she had the motive, the desire. I guess that counts for something, right? <laughs> when Pastor Alex turns to Pastor Carla and says, Pastor Carla, would you please bring me a slice of cake? You know what her answer was? No way, I'm not going to bring two. <laughs> All I 
I can say is that that is my sister-in-law right there. <laughs> That's really who she is. <laughs> she hasn't changed one bit. <laughs> then I turned to my wife and said, honey, would you please bring me a piece of cake? And as I'm asking her, she's there eating cake. <laughs> and she says, there's no more cake for you. So I became furious, <laughs> and I went back to where they were eating cake, and little did I did not know she had reserved a piece of cake for me. No, actually, it wasn't you. It was somebody else. My mother-in-law reserved a piece of cake for me. And my wife said that she didn't even think about giving me a piece of cake. So... I prepared this message specifically for Pastor Carla <laughs> and it's specifically for my wife. Unfortunately, Pastor Carla is not here today. She's with the children. But I will preach her on Facebook or some other way. But my wife is here. So this message is for my wife and for every other unsubmitted woman that is listening to me <laughs> tonight. The only winner out of all this was Lorraine Maloney, <laughs> Brian's wife, who eventually got his piece of cake. So kudos to you. All right. <laughs> now, who is the greatest man who ever lived? Jesus. And the Bible says that he is the greatest man who ever lived, and he also is the greatest servant of all. The greatest, say with me, Jesus is the greatest servant of all. And because he is the greatest servant of all, he became the greatest man who ever lived. So if we want to be great, if we want to see greatness in our lives, especially in our homes, it's going to begin by serving. Okay? And he, it's amazing. He, he became the greatest man, not by political endeavors, you know, or by accumulating money, power, success. He became the greatest man who ever lived. And that's the reason why we're here today because he was willing to stoop down and serve others. Isn't that amazing? Now, what made him do that? What made him so secure, so secure that he was able to actually let go of his splendor, let go of his position, his title, everything, and actually wash his disciples' feet? What gave, what, what motivated him? You know, as I was praying about this, you know, the Lord, first of all, led me to John chapter 13, verse 3. So let's look at it. John chapter 13, verse 3. It says, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. Notice here how Jesus knew that all things were already his. It says, the Father, his Father, our Father, had put all things under whose power? His power. All things is everything. You, me, earth, the future, present, everything was under his power and his control, and it still is today. So talk about somebody who had everything. And he knew he had everything. So because he knew he already had everything, he didn't have to use the world system to try to gain anything. World system meaning using deceit, lies, cheating, physical force. Everything that the world teaches that we have to use or should use to get ahead in life. Manipulate, control people, push people, threaten people. The world's ways. 
which says if you don't do this, or even a little bit of it, you won't get ahead in life. He never did that. Why? Because he knew that he already had everything. So he didn't have to fight. He didn't have to negotiate. He didn't have to deceive. He didn't have to do anything like that that the world does in order to feel like he was getting ahead in life. Everything was already his. Does that make sense to you? Now, let me go further with this. Because you're thinking, oh, yeah, Jesus, of course, he's got everything. I mean, he's Jesus. He's the Christ. Yeah. But he also did something else that will liberate you and free you to serve. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Ah, he got it up there. Awesome. <laughs> Praise, look what he says here. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ in his great mercy. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth. How many here are Christians? Raise your hand. If you're a Christian, you have been granted new birth. That's why the Bible says you're a new creation in Christ Jesus. Amen, church. But look at what he says here. Into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Verse 4. And into... An inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. Do you know what this means? It means exactly what it says. There is prepared for you in heaven an inheritance that will never perish. It never goes old, doesn't spoil, doesn't rot. And never fades. The colors in heaven never fades. That's good news for you ladies. Red never fades in heaven. If you get a red dress in heaven, it's going to be red for the rest of your life, for the rest of eternity. If you paint your nails in heaven, if you can paint your, I don't know if you can paint, I don't know. Whatever you paint your nails, if you can't paint your nails in heaven, it's going to remain that color for the rest of eternity. So those who are in that business will go bankrupt. Because colors in heaven never fade. Nothing in heaven is perishing. Nothing in heaven is spoiling. Nothing yeah. in heaven is fading away. That's what he has prepared for you. He also said, I go to prepare a place for you so that where I am, you may be also. So he also has a house, a building prepared for all of you in heaven. It's like some of you who came to the United States as immigrants. Can you imagine if somebody here in the U.S. said to you in your country, come on over, I've got a house, provision, cars, clothing, food, schooling, education, and work all prepared for you. Just get on the plane, and even the ticket for the plane, the airfare, I've got covered for you. Everything, passport, visa, Forget Visa, I got your green card for you. Can you imagine if somebody actually did that for you? Would you have to worry about anything if somebody ever did that for you in coming over? Not much. Why? Because it's guaranteed. But he goes further. In Romans 8.32, he goes further. Here it says we have an inheritance waiting for us. But Romans 8.32, it says this. About you and me. He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Now, the last one we read in First Peter has to do with the future eternity. This one has to do with the now. What is he saying here? He is saying... Whatever it is that you need from the day you got saved, from the day you experienced new birth, whatever it is that you need, I've got you covered. I am your provider. I am your father. I will take care of you. You need a car, just ask me for it. You need a house, just ask me for it. You need a husband, just ask me for it. You need a job, just ask me for it. 
And even the things that you forget to ask me or don't know what to ask me, I already know what you need. I will provide for you. He does that for us. You know why he does that for us? Because he wants us to be like Jesus. He wants us to understand that like Jesus, who has received all power, therefore he was free from, from the world system. He could serve freely. We also have been given an inheritance in Christ that is waiting for us in the future and also belongs to us today. Now, see, the more we believe that, the more it frees us to serve. Because, see, never forget what I'm about to say. When it comes to obedience, okay, obey, disobey, it's really not a question. Of, when it comes to serving, it's not a question of obey or disobey. It's a question of trust. Do you trust me, Jesus says. Do you trust me enough to actually stop trying to move ahead in life with your own efforts? Do you trust me enough to stop trying to use people for your gain? Do you trust me enough to try to stop manipulating people to get what you want? And start serving people. Then true promotion will come to you. Then he will promote you. Wasn't he who said, if you want to take the high seats, the best seats, first take the lowly seats. So when the owner of the house comes in and sees you seated in the lowly seats, he will come and say, come and sit in the lofty seat. So when you understand that God has got you covered, he has already assumed responsibility for you. He has already promised to provide everything that you need. So you don't need to go around using people to get ahead in life. You don't need to go around using people for your advantage. Lying and cheating and deceiving. Hurting people's emotions. Breaking friendships. Because you feel that. You need to get ahead in life. And you use people for that. And you do that because you feel that if you don't do it, you have not guaranteed for yourself a future. Provision will not be there tomorrow. That's why we do it. So the serving business doesn't get you ahead in life, we think. To actually roll your sleeves and help somebody. Do something for someone. Help somebody. Put their interests before yourself. Doesn't get you ahead in life. Doesn't help you financially. Doesn't help you politically. Doesn't help you economically. <laughs> Glory to God. Amen. <laughs> Are you receiving this? Yes. That's how we think. That's the worldly mindset. So Jesus is t teaching us, you need to Renew your mind. You need to understand that in, in my kingdom, in the kingdom of God, which is your kingdom, the ones who are last are first. And the ones who want to be first are always last. Hmm? Now, how are you going to find ultimate fulfillment in your life? Well, First of all, understand this. God created you in such a way that you will never find ultimate fulfillment until you serve others. Do you know why people fall into depression? Now, I know there's, there's explanations that we can go into, chemical analysis and all that. But the bottom line is this. And I've heard psychologists say this. Psychiatrists say the same thing. People who understand a lot about the subject say the same thing. They say, one of the best ways to get rid of depression in your life is to get your mind off of yourself and start putting your efforts and your mind and your desires to help others. 
get busy helping somebody, ministering to somebody. That's one of the best ways. Why? Because God created us to serve. In the fall, when Adam fell, Eve fell, we became self-centered. We became so self-centered that everything has become about our comfort, our desires, our wants, our life, our provision, our, everything is all about us. So Jesus comes as the second Adam, as the last Adam, and says, hey, you got it all wrong. Let's, let's, let's change it back to the way I created you to be. I created you to serve. And you will never truly be happy in life. You never truly be satisfied until you for, start forgetting a little bit about yourself and start putting other people before yourself today. Glory to God. Amen. Why? Because in the kingdom of God, true greatness is not achieved by power, position, or human achievement, but by sacrifice, humility, surrender, obedience, and total dependency on him. That's the kingdom of heaven. See, when you give something, when you serve, when you serve cake to somebody before they even ask, <laughs> don't you feel good? <laughs> My wife says, no. <laughs> That's a different story. Doesn't it feel good? An article in Psychology Today said that those who volunteer, this is Psychology Magazine, it said those who volunteer were happier, healthier, emotionally, and physically than those who didn't. So the, the secret of your joy and your fulfillment in life is to serve others. And in a marriage, this is equally important. They did a test with chickens not too long ago. Um, and it's called the pecking order. Have you ever heard about the term pecking order? Well, you will find out tonight. These farmers who did this noticed, uh, this was years ago, that if they put 10 chickens together in a pen, in a short time, they, they witnessed an amazing phenomenon. Within minutes, the chickens, even if they were strangers to each other before, will form a hierarchy based on dominance. That's where we get the term pecking order. Instinctively, they will determine through a series of skirmishes, which chicken is number one, which is number two, and so on and so forth, until the last one, the tenth one. So this process, okay, established the ranks in the chicken group. In other words, who is the honcho here? Who is the boss here? It all depended on who was pecking the most, who was hurting the other the most. So by the, all the pecking, all the squirmishes between the chickens, they will finally determine who is the head honcho, who is the big kahuna, the big boss, the big bossy chicken. <laughs> Why? Because perhaps that one was the one who hurt the most, who pecked the most. And then it goes right down to number two, number three, and to the last one who didn't do any pecking at all, but suffered all the pecking from everybody else. Okay, now this pecking order, okay, you, you may think it's only for chickens. <laughs> you see this among businessmen, especially in the room together, okay? When they walk in the room, they begin to tell stories about who is the most effective, who made the most money. You see this with pastors. When they come together, who's got the biggest church, who's got the biggest budget, Who's got the more members? You see this in a marriage. You see this in a marriage. I'm going to take control. I'm going to do this. I'm better at that. Forget you. I'll take care of the money.
Unfortunately, this can happen in marriage. The bickering and the pecking can take place. One trying to dominate the other. To control the other. To see who's going to be the boss. Who's going to control the house. Who's going to control the children. Who's going to control the budget. When the Bible clearly says that you have to do it together. When the Bible teaches that we have to submit to one another in the fear and love of Christ. See, marriage can be one huge pecking order if you're not careful. That's why somebody once said marriage needs one wedding and two funerals. One wedding and two funerals. So when it comes to serving, if you're not careful, you can be like a chicken or like chickens trying to establish who will who will be dominant in that union? And that is so wrong. You know, because I don't have the time to show you there, but in the book of Ephesians, it says to the husbands, love your wives. But it doesn't stop there. He found a verse. Wow. Thank you, Vinny. See, that, that, me, that boy's getting ready for marriage. For him to pop up this verse in Scripture in a fraction of a second faster than he did with the other one. It just goes to show us that the boy is ready for marriage. All right. <laughs> Ra Rafaela, you got the right guy, girl. Let's look at what Paul says. He says, husbands, love your wives. How? Just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. We read this, but sometimes we really don't understand what it's saying here to the husbands. Here's what it's saying. The amount of love that you're going to love your wife with will depend on how much understanding you have of Christ's love for you. Because it says, as Christ loved the church. So do you know how, because since you're part of the church, you're a husband, so, and you're a Christian, so you're a part of the church. So if you're part of the church, let me ask you this, husbands. Do you know how much Christ loved you and loves you to the point that he served you and still serves you to the degree that he gave his life for you? Once you know that, once you understand that, your side of the pecking order ends. And you start what? You start loving your wife. Meeting her needs, caring for her, supporting her, blessing her, protecting her, praying for her. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Exactly how Christ does for you and me. So, men of the house, you need to understand the love of Christ for you and his servant's heart for you. And out of that, you transfer that over to your wife. And once that happens, submission from your wife to you will be so natural. So now, what woman will not surrender herself to a man like Jesus? You will get slices of cake every morning, honey. <laughs> every morning. It's true. This is where the pecking order ends. Striving. Domineering spirit. Who's going to be dominant? Who's going to be the dominant one in our relationship? Who's going to control? Who's going to make the decisions? And then that's where arguments arise. 
Oh, you don't know what you're talking about. You're not spiritual like I am. You don't pray as much as I am. You don't, you're not as smart as I am. You, I'm better than you. I mean, we may not talk that way, but we shove each other like we're actually expressing that. So the pecking order ends by the man loving the wife as Christ loves him and her. And then through that love, she will submit openly, voluntarily to you. See, the woman wants to submit. Problem is, she can't trust you. Trust you enough. But when you do that, but see, it becomes with the personal revelation first, okay? Now, okay, I need to finish. <laughs> Let me give you two minutes about a fair proof in your marriage. This is very important. You know, some of you here are probably experiencing a lot of pain because of, of an affair that went on in your marriage. Maybe you don't even want to hear about this, but this has to be addressed. When it comes to serving, I spoke the first week about the spouse's needs and they are what? Men are sexual fulfillment, recreational companionship, a good-looking wife, peace and quiet and admiration. The women's needs are what? Affection, conversation, honesty and openness, financial support, family commitment. I spoke about, about that the first two or three weeks of this teaching series. These needs are needs that we have as husbands and wives, okay? And when it comes to serving, as a servant, I'm not here to impose on my wife sexual fulfillment. I'm not here to impose on my wife recreational companionship and so on and so forth. I'm not going to demand this from her. Instead, as a servant, because I'm called to serve, I'm going to do my best out of love to give her the affection that she needs talk to her anytime she needs to talk to somebody. To be honest and open about my feelings. To provide financial support the best that I can and be committed to the family. And I do this as a servant because first of all, I know how much Jesus loves me. I'm secure in his love. I know that he has already provided everything that I need so I don't need to control and manipulate. I'm secure in Jesus. So I'm free to render to my wife the needs that she has that needs to be fulfilled as a servant. And as her being a servant, she also provides for these needs in my life. But we do it as servants. We don't do it because we have to, because we want to, because I love my wife. And this works, church. This works. And meeting these needs will affair proof your marriage, will protect your marriage, will keep your marriage from being destroyed. So, the secret of a fruitful, strong marriage, a fair proof marriage, is meeting the needs. And meeting those needs come from a servant's heart who understands the love of God for him for her and is also secure in the provision of the Father. You understand? That changes everything. So I can love my wife. I can do all these things that will meet her needs as a female. Not because I'm a good man, not because she deserves it, but because Jesus is good to me. He's kind to me. He loves me. He protects me. He has already provided everything that I need, not only today, but he has wonderful provision and inheritance for me in the future. I'm covered. I'm okay. So because of that, I'm secure. My identity is Christ. Not
not my performance. So I can love my wife. I can treat her good. Even when she forgets to give me slices of cake. It doesn't bother me. Amen? <laughs> it doesn't bother me one bit. Why? Because I'm secure. I'm secure in Christ. I'm secure in His love for me. So it is liberating to serve, church. It is liberating to put others before yourself. It is good for you. You were created for that. It was meant for you. And I pray today that if you're married today you would start meeting the needs of your spouse if you're not married or if you're going through the divorce you're still a servant because even though you may not have your spouse with you you still have others with you friends family continue or start to serve them be a blessing to them if you're single and you are not married and you're not planning on getting married, you're a servant. Start serving others. Start calling others. Hey, what do you need? Do you need prayer? Do you need me to help you with something? Or pray for God to put people across your path. Start exercising that spirit of a servant. And you'll see how promotions, blessings, Will come your way even if you don't pray for them. I'm not saying you shouldn't pray, but even sometimes when we don't pray, forget to pray, it's just because of the fact that we're taking the last place, the last seat. We're taking the towel of a servant and serving others. Jesus said, those who are last shall be first. God will promote you. I want this church to be a church who serves, that serves, and serves joyfully. Amen, church. Do you receive this today?